Welcome back to In Other Waters. Last episode, we finished exploring the two extra Baikal sites, one over here, and then one way out here past the Pillar Gardens. And from that, we got a lot of information about something called the Oceanic Mind that's up here way north in the deep, around these deep vents that I think it uses for geothermal energy. So that's the next big thing to do. But before that, we have a new entry here. I was born on Earth, born in the city of Ponta Delgada, out in the Atlantic, among the turquoise waters and green slopes of the Azores. My father was studying the dying waters, chasing the last known pod of sperm whales to record a final fading image of their impossible spatial language before it was lost forever. My mother was a journalist writing a book on citizen scientists that never found a publisher. We lived there, and all along the Atlantic coast of Europe, for almost a decade before life became impossible. The storms tearing into the tidal walls, flooding city after city, clothes twisted in foaming water. We joined the latest waves of refugees, found ourselves beside the Thames, resettled in London. From that privileged viewpoint, I watched our oceans die, and then my parents too. And at some point, once I'd left that sad gray planet behind on a string of Baikal contracts, I forgot that turquoise water ever existed. You were born here, and maybe here, things can be different. By the way, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this in a recording yet or not, but you know how Manet is this now? All those pulsing dots? I don't know exactly what that is, but remember Ellery said that Manet is growing and then later said that what, what the medbay looked like was beautiful and based on all those dots, it looks like they've turned into a colony of life forms, plants, something. We know that the artificers were able to rewrite DNA and RNA and just rewrite life completely using those abilities. I'm just thinking, could that be used somehow? I don't know if the oceanic mind might be able to help us. We'll see, I guess. But I wonder if that could be utilized to restore Manet to how they were. I have no idea, but just a thought I had. Okay, we have some new taxonomy entries and I think some new things to scan. I can't remember if I've scanned them already or if they still need to be scanned. I guess first I should check whether I actually transferred them. I did not. Colony bladder. And colony tentacle. Rattus colony. I don't think we had anything for it before, but now we have everything. The Rattus colony is a huge colonial organism made of layers of zooids all occupying different roles within its large and complex body. Closer to a living island or iceberg than a creature, Rattus is a free-floating structure which travels across the surface of Gliese 667cc's planet-spanning ocean. Trying to observe the patterns of Rattus is a difficult task. I've counted tens of different zooid types, flowing in constant movement throughout its cavernous interior. We can assume that they occupy the typical roles of a colonial organism, uh, motility, defense, digestion, and reproduction. But in a colony so vast, many other processes may be happening. Does Rattus have any neural activity? And why does it cling to the remains of the Baikal lab? Sampling some of the different zooid types may help us understand more about this colony behavior. Sampling the colony's gas bladders helped us to analyze how Rattus stays afloat. It seems that thousands of these bladders of different sizes both keep Rattus at the surface and hold the fragments of the laboratory in place. These bladders, with their high oxygen content, can be inflated or deflated individually to respond to currents and move Rattus across the ocean. 
This suggests that Redis has some way of orchestrating massive changes across its huge volume. In a sense, perhaps Radis is better thought of as an individual with various specialized organs rather than a colony, and yet it shows no signs of a central intelligence. If I was to discover neural activity within Radis, could I even understand it? This creature is so alien to our way of understanding the world. Theories Analyzing Radis's tentacles has shown they possess an ability to secrete metal digesting substances. The conclusion is that these tentacles are consuming the lab piece by piece, using it to fuel the colony's incredible growth. Perhaps Radis was once a tiny creature floating in a biologist's tank. When the facility was breached, Radis, Radis was gifted a near inexhaustible amount of metal to consume, allowing it to grow to its vast size. One day, it will eat away the entire structure, its body carrying the shadow of this planet's first human settlement. Sometimes I wish that our marks on Earth could be erased so easily, but the only shadows in our oceans are those of thousands of extinct species we will never regain. The zoo at Colony is approximately 70 meters in height. That is massive. I think that might be the complete taxonomy. It was at, I think, 97% complete when I last loaded my save. Let's go check. Save and quit to menu. And yeah. That's everything. That's 100%. Oceanic Mind, here we come. Thankfully, from my experience trying to get into the Abyss, I remembered that I should just directly go there and not try to find a way there. We're almost at the hydrothermal vents. Three kilometers down. This has to be close to the suit's range. I can hear the plates creaking. Somehow, we're maintaining one atmosphere of pressure inside the hard suit. If we make it back up, we'll be setting a strong first record for deep dives on Gliese 667cc. There's almost nothing in the water column here. No life to speak of. But the oceanic mine should be somewhere ahead. That's our target. Whatever monster Baikal left us. I'm ready. Let's find it. Abyssal Plain, layered with a wispy fog of oceanic ooze, the darkness of the plain is absolute. Metal sediments. Streaks of iron ore have accrued across the seafloor, the mark of nearby hydrothermal activity. There's not enough oxygen down here to use the rebreather, so I'm on reserves. The survey data we pulled shows the vents running north from here along a ridge. Uh, keep moving. We haven't got long. Can I leave, by the way, if I needed to, if I ran out of oxygen? No. I say if I ran out of oxygen, but I don't need oxygen. Ellery does. And I'd prefer them to stay alive. I like them quite a bit. Basalt crust. Edges of volcanic rock poke through the sediment. Black strips against the bright mineral and metal ores. Sediment snow. A soft drift of sediment flakes catch in the suit's lamps, falling from the venting fluid as it spreads into the waters above. An hydrite chimney. Black plumes of fluid rise from a crystalline chimney, discolored with yellow sulfur streaks.
incredible. Look at these things. I remember reading about the discovery of hydrothermal vents on Earth centuries ago. Donnelly, Corliss, and Van Andel, three geologists. They never expected to find something, uh, and yet there it was. Whole ecosystems we never knew were there, totally independent of the sun's light. They were imagined to be models of alien ecosystems, life in its most extreme forms. But until this planet, I proved to be false. To all of humanity, the universe was dead. Damn by call for keeping this place from us. For keeping humanity in the dark. Talk sand. Bone pale sand mounds around the chimneys like great piles of cremation ash. Chimney cluster. Towering pale spires shimmer with the intense heat of the vents as chemicals are pumped into the water from deep within the planet. Oh, split in directions. Let's go left. Vent structure. The tiered structure of the vents evidences their eons of incremental growth as deposits build up around them. Bright bubbles. Gases vent up through the sand, creating these thin strings of bubbles. Pyrite crust. The glint of fool's gold catches the light of the lamps scattered among the talc mounds. Vent debris. Away from the center of the cluster, of the cluster, collapsed chimneys and pillow lava create a landscape of stratified shapes. New chimney. Another vent is beginning to form in the rock here. A low pile of crystalline and hydrite starting to gather. Oh, there's a lot of directions to go. Well, this way is just going to go back to the right side around this uh, big vent down here. So I don't think we need to see that. And we know there's not going to be any samples of new life forms there because we have 100% of the taxonomy. So, I don't know. I'll go right now. Cooler water. The intense heat of the vents quickly fades off as it mixes with the cold seawater. Sand plain. Out of sight of the vents, hidden in the dark, the heavy silence of the seafloor returns. Talk drifts. Eons of sediment blanket the seafloor. So pale and empty. The artificial mine Akari was building down here. What was the end goal? Was Baikal hoping to control this whole ecosystem? An entire planetary agriculture attuned to feed their needs? An ecology manipulated by the possibility of genetic rewriting? A power stolen from the artificers. An enslaved planet. Like Earth. I know now why Manet was secretive. She knew that if they found this place again, that would be it for life here. An hydrate chimney. Another vent chimney. Where is all the life that should thrive on the rich fluid which blackens the water? Vent debris. Strange, tiered and curved rocks sit all around, distorted by tectonic processes and stained with mineral growth. Chimney cluster. 
The surfaces around this vent are thick with sediment, but absent of all life. Even the ubiquitous bacterial mats are nowhere to be seen. Another barren vent. This place has been wiped clean. Something is wrong here. What did they do? Bubble stream. Around the base of the vents, gas bubbles stream out of cracks, forming pillars which glitter beautifully in the suit's lamps. Talk piles. The bleached sand is almost perversely clean. No life has marked its surface in decades. An hydrite spire. Another spire sits at the edge of the cluster, filling the water with blackened fluid like a lightless bonfire. Okay, that looks like a big structure to the west of us. Calcified corpses. Here, away from the vents, piles and piles of distorted corpses lie, their whorled bones dusted with pale sediments. Jesus. Oh God, look at these creatures. The bodies. It looks like progressive ossification. The muscles have become bone. Their mutations are extreme, like cancerous growths. There's no structure to their anatomy. The mind, is this what it made? These senseless monstrosities? Corpse piles, radial piles of long dead creatures frozen in crippled states of deformation scar the seafloor. Biological matter. The corpses become a mass of undifferentiated matter with the occasional shape of a bone or shell, like a tooth growing inside a tumor. Shattered dome. A vast organic sphere towers over the corpses, its ornate geodesic patterns mirroring those of the artificers. The mind, it's huge, but it's silent. It's been silent for decades. This is no cradle of life. It's a grave. Did they fail? Is this all that's left? A broken mind lying in a bed of corpses? They had no idea what they were doing. The arrogance of all this. A whole ecosystem boiled down to nothing. The artificers lost to us. These are Baikal's crimes. Akari's crimes. What a waste. Is there nothing left? We should look inside. The oceanic mind. A vast ornate structure grown in the Baikal labs sits broken and dead on the seafloor, its interior a dark cavern. Down we go. This music is really creeping me out. And also the pile of bodies. Down. 
that's an unscanned creature, and yet the taxonomy is done. That must be... the mind? Oh, the mind's heart. Deep inside the oceanic mind, something flickers in the ruins. Is that... an artificer? It survived. Or... it was born here? Does that mean there are more? It looks dormant. Is it even alive? Wait, do you hear that? It's singing. I can feel... It knows. It knows what we are. And it's afraid. I understand why. Look what humans did here. I'm sorry. Wait. No, come back. It's gone. We should be going too. We're running down our oxygen, and it's a long way back up. Come on, there's nothing left for us here. The artificers aren't all dead. And they can rewrite life. Could they fix all this? I mean, you can't undo what's... You can't undo everything that's already happened, but... Could undo some of it. from here. No. Okay. Time to go. I'm beginning the ascent. So they are still out there. The artificers. This is their planet. And we owe them so much. I suppose it's your planet too. With the mine being a failure, the colony destroyed. You are its last artifact, born here. And now, this is my home too. Mine and Manet's. There's so much left for me to do. So much to study. So much to understand. Our history here. It is ugly. It's something I don't want to be part of. But this planet's future? Maybe we can have a part in that. Manet gave everything for the truth. Some residual part of the artificers changed her, but I hope she knows, knows that she succeeded. This place is no longer a secret, no longer by calls to control. Thank you, Manet. And thank you, to you, for staying with me for guiding me. Together, I think we can make a change. Show humanity by calls crimes. Make them accountable. We both carry burdens here, but the past doesn't define us. Life continues here, 
despite everything that happened, I can find comfort in that. I think I'm going to stay. I don't have anything left out there, but here I have Manet. I have you. And I have a purpose. Someone needs to swim these waters, to catalog this world. When I was little, I swam every day. I would walk down to the ocean and step into it without a thought. I lost that, degree by degree, as Earth's oceans died. But here, things can be like that once again. These waters can wash all the old ways away. And together, we'll see what's left when they do. Let's finish with some thoughts about In Other Waters. I am just completely in love with it. This is such a beautiful thing. Exploring this planet and finding all of these fascinating new life forms is just so interesting. I loved reading about all of them. The sense of exploration and wanting to peek around every corner to find something was just so strong. And the writing for locations and creatures and, and dialogue and everything was so beautifully done. It painted such a vivid picture, which is especially important because the visuals are so simplified. I love how much kindness and gentleness there is towards the planet and the creatures that are living on it. In the writing in general, and also specifically Ellery and Manet, this whole experience has just been filled with wonder and intrigue and sadness and then at the end hope and i love it so so much well i guess i'll end it there i hope you've enjoyed and thanks for watching Okie, okay. I'm up at the calm level. Come quick. I'm about to do something stupid. I repair the antenna. I'm starting to think I should have been an engineer. I know I said we would wait to be rescued, but I'm sick of waiting. Everything we've discovered together, this whole ecosystem, we need to share it. I'm about to broadcast it all. Your scans and maps, my notes and sketches, everything we know about Glee SA667CC. I'm sending it on all channels, a million data packets heading out into the black. That way we can be sure it will make it out. We don't own this place, not any more than anyone else. So we can't keep it just for ourselves. There's too much beauty. Too much hope in these documents. Too much of a future. All these hours of study and discovery. 
They've changed me, changed my life. But I'm ready for what comes next. Thank you for helping me get here. Right, that's enough of a speech. I've talked enough for the both of us by now. It's up to you to do the honors. Hit the switch. It's time. Not quite yet, because I think this must be the way that we read the final crew terminal entry. Now, the real work begins. Whatever was left of the oceanic mind, it's dead. Another failed experiment. Another biological atrocity to add to humanity's list. But I don't want to let it define us and our role on this planet. We can't start fresh, I know that, but the artificers are still here, and that means we can reach them. I want to show them we're curious, we're kind, we're able to live alongside them. There's still so much left to study here, so many questions to answer, but I'm not scared anymore. I'm excited to see what we can achieve in the time we have. People will come here soon enough, and when they do, I want to show them what we found the evidence of Baikal's crimes, and what we need to protect. If people can see this place for what it is, a second chance, then maybe they'll want to protect it too. That's what my father believed, and my mother believed, that if people could understand what they were losing, they would want to save it. Let's get to work. Antenna extended, all channels open, Signal active. 